Hey everybody, and welcome to the seventh episode of the Level Creation Guide for Half-Life. In the previous episode, we learned how to use new tools, entities, and shapes to create an outdoor area. In this episode, we will be learning how to create stairways, ladders, and lifts. For this episode, I have created two rooms, with one of the rooms stacked on top of the other. I have carved a few holes into the floor for each of our stairway, ladder, and lift to occupy as we progress through this episode. I have also added an info player start, item suit, and have a couple of light entities for both rooms. Now that we have that out of the way, let's begin with creating a stairway starting with our first step. Using the block tool, create a 16 unit tall, 24 unit deep, and 64 unit wide block. Texture the top and front faces with these textures. You may have to do some texture alignment to get the textures positioned correctly. And texture the sides and back with this other texture. This step's dimensions are good for any basic one-man stairway. We can make this stair wider if we wanted to make it a multi-man stairway, but let's just keep our step its regular size for this episode. Now that we have created our first step, let's continue to build the rest of our stairway. To duplicate our step, simply hold shift and drag click it away from the original. Place each newly duplicated step in succession until we have 8 steps in total. Once all eight are created, select them and press Ctrl G to group them together. There we go, we've created our first basic stairway. Now, before we continue to playtest our stairway, there's a couple improvements we can make to it. The first improvement is primarily an aesthetic one. We can make the underside of our stairway flat instead of blocky looking. To make our stairways underneath flat, select our stairway and use the clipping tool to cut diagonally across it using the side viewport. Be sure to highlight the top half white only by using Shift X to rotate through the cut options, and once ready press enter to cut. Once cut, fix any textures that might have been affected, and that should be it. The second improvement we can make to our stairway is by eliminating the bump up effect. If we playtest our stairway in game, the player will make a bump up effect with each step traveled. While this isn't a bug and is expected given the player traveling up 90 degree blocks, we can still remove this effect by creating an invisible slope across the tops of our steps to allow for a better transition between each step resulting in a smooth travel. To create an invisible slope, let's start by creating a block that completely covers our entire stairway. Then, use the clipping tool and side viewport to position a cut diagonally across the block. Highlight the top side white to keep it from being deleted, and press enter to cut. Select our new cut block and let's cut it again by using the clipping tool and positioning a cut across the tops of our steps. Highlight the top block red to delete it and press enter to cut. Once cut, let's extend our block to the bottom of the step by using the vertex tool. Select our block, click on the vertex tool, and move the vertex points down to make a full slope. Now that a thin slope is built, all we need to do is make it invisible. To do this, we're going to have to use the AAA texture. This texture will make our slope invisible, just like we made our trigger entities invisible back in episode 5. Let's select our slope and apply the AAA texture to it. Now 
If we playtest our stairway out in-game, our entire stairway will be invisible. This is due to our invisible slope colliding and covering our entire stairway. An easy fix for this is simply transforming our invisible slope into a funk wall entity. This will separate our stairway and invisible slope to prevent them from colliding. Let's now group our stairway and an invisible slope together. and position it underneath a longer hole in the ceiling. Once positioned, let's test it out in game. Great job, our stairway looks great. We are now ready to move on to the next part of this episode, which will be learning how to create ladders. Creating ladders in Half-Life requires two function entities. The first entity will be the block that has the textured appearance of the ladder, and the second will be what gives the functionality of the ladder. Let's start by creating a 128 by 32 unit block with a thickness being 4 units. Texture the large faces of this block with the ladder texture. And the top, bottom and edges with this red texture. Transform this block into a funk wall entity by pressing Ctrl T and it will be transformed into a funk wall entity by default. Change the render mode option to texture. This will make it show our ladder texture and it will be transparent between the steps. Lastly, set the FX amount to 255 in order to show the rest of our texture at full opacity. Next, create another 128 by 32 unit block, but this time with the thickness being 1 unit. Texture this block with the AAA texture and place it directly in front, touching the funk wall entity. Select this newly created block and transform it into the funk ladder entity. Let's now duplicate this funk ladder block and place it on the opposite side of the ladder by holding shift and drag selecting our block over. This will allow us to climb up both sides of the ladder. Lastly, let's select all three of our ladder blocks and press Ctrl G to group them together. Now looking at the attribute section of the funk ladder, it will reveal its lack of options. This is the reason why we needed to create a separate block with the ladder textures applied to it. The lack of options doesn't allow us to texture the funk ladder entity. And since there are no options, let's move on and position our ladder in the smaller sized hole in the ceiling. Then, let's extend our ladder's height until it's flush with the upstairs room floor. Once positioned, let's test it out in game. Great job! Our ladder works and looks great. It's time for us to move on to the last part of this episode where we're going to be learning how to create lifts. In order to create lifts in Half-Life, we're going to need three separate components. A lift, path entities the lift will travel to, and a trigger or button entity to activate our lift to travel. Let's begin by creating our lift. Let's create a 128 by 128 unit block with the thickness being 8 units for our lift platform. Then, let's texture our platform with this metal texture on all sides. Once textured, place the block on the bottom floor directly under the large opening in our ceiling. Lastly, let's transform this block into a new function entity called the Funk Train Entity. The Function Train Entity is used frequently throughout Half-Life. 
and gives our block the ability to travel to path entities. We'll be talking about path entities in a little bit. The function train entities attribute section contains name, sound, damage on crush, angular velocity, or in other words, rotation speed, and first stop target options. Let's add the name lift01 to the name option and set the move sound to tech le1. This will give our lift sound when moving. The first stop target option is where we'll be adding the path entity's name in order for our lift to know which path to travel. Our lift will also spawn on the first point of the chosen path in game. Let's add the name path01 to this option, so in future we can simply add path01 to our path entity without needing to come back to this option. Now that our func train lift is all set up, we're ready to move on to the next component, which is path entities. Firstly, what are path entities? These entities are basically points, or stops, that our func train entity will travel to when activated. Path entities are responsible not for just elevators, but for the opening train sequence in Half-Life. To create path entities, let's use an exclusive Jack tool called the Path tool. This tool allows us to create path entities without having to manually create them using the Entity tool, and also gives us an intuitive visual. To create our first path entity using this tool, let's select the Path tool icon and use the front viewport to create our first path entity. Hold Shift and left click anywhere between our first and second floor. A pop up will appear giving us a few different options for our entire path. The name option is where we're going to be adding the name Path01 to. This means when our Funk Train lift is activated, it will travel to this specific path. This is a really nice option as without this tool, we would have to string together a bunch of path entity names and it would just become a mess. Jack makes it much simpler by giving us one name for the entire path, and it will follow our path points. The class option gives us two different path entities to choose from. The difference between path corner and path train is the application of what we're going to be using these for. For most cases, the path corner entity is the primary path entity to use, whereas path track is used specifically for another function entity called the func train track entity. Let's select the path corner entity as our class option. The last option is the direction. These directional options control what direction our func train can go between the path points. The one way direction allows our func train to travel in only a single direction in the entire path. The circular direction is nearly identical with the one way direction but automatically connects the first and last path points together to allow for a continuous loop. This automatic connection also applies with just two path points, allowing a func train to travel between both points without a problem. And lastly, the ping pong direction allows our func train to travel between path points as long as they're connected directly to each other. Due to a couple issues I've been experiencing with the ping pong directional option, Let's select the circular option for our lift and press OK. Our first path point is now created. This means we can build off this point by first selecting it and holding Shift and clicking above it. You'll see a line connecting both of our points with two arrows pointed at each other. This indicates that our path can go between both directions and is now connected. We, of course, can keep holding down Shift and click everywhere to expand our path to a bunch of different positions, but let's just keep it at 2. We can also right-click on one of our path entities to bring up a small menu. There are plenty of useful options we can use here, but we won't be needing to adjust these for this episode. Warning. If you're having problems being unable to select your path points, remember to select the path tool option or else Jack won't allow you to interact with these paths or points. Now that we have both points, let's position the bottom point to be directly in the middle of our funk train lift and the other to be directly above it in the middle of the opening of our floor.
Once positioned, let's double click on our first path point to bring up its properties. There are several options here that are for specific uses, but let's just focus on speed, weight, and wait for retrigger options. The speed controls how fast our lift will go in order to reach from the first point to the second point. A value of 50 is a good starting point for this option. The wait time is how long in seconds the lift will wait after being activated. This helps with giving the player some time before the lift begins moving. Let's add the value of 5 so we'll wait 5 seconds before moving. The wait before retrigger options stops the lift from continuously traveling without the player needing to reactivate it. Let's check this option so our lift won't do this. Click OK to apply the settings, and let's double click on the second point to bring up its properties. The second point properties should be identical in most situations with the first point properties, but instead of checking the last wait before retrigger, let's keep this setting unchecked so it will return back to the first point's position without needing to be activated again. Press OK to apply these settings, and our path entities should be all set. The last component we need for our lift is a trigger entity or button. Since we have learned how to use trigger entities back in episode 5, let's use the function button entity instead to activate our lift. Create a small 4x12 unit block with the height being 20 units. Texture the front face with this button texture. And then texture the sides with this texture. Position this block close to, but not on top of the lift, around the player's height. Use info player start for a reference if you need to. Once positioned, transform this block into the funk button entity. The function button entity is similar to the trigger entities. The key differences are that the button is a visible entity and can be interacted with by damage, player touch, or by the use key. Another interesting thing to note about the function button entity is that by default it will recede when being activated. While this is a pretty cool feature that has some attribute settings we can adjust, it's not very much used and can be disabled in the flag section by checking the don't move option. For this episode, let's disable this option so our button won't move when being activated. The function button entity has a ton of attribute and flag settings we can adjust. The most important option of this entity is its target option. Like the trigger entities, this is where we're going to place the name of the entity we wish to trigger once this button entity is activated. Let's add the name lift01 to our target section so this button will activate our lift. The next and second most important option is the health shootable if greater than zero option. This option controls whether this button can be activated when damaged and has only two values we can use, 1 or 0. By default, this option starts with a value of 1, meaning it needs to be damaged in order to be activated. However, this also means it cannot be activated by players using the use key on it. For our test level, let's disable this option to allow us to use the use key on it by putting the value of 0. The last two options are the Delay Before Trigger and Delay Before Reset options. The Delay Before Trigger gives us an option to put, in seconds, how long of a wait between being pressed and activating its target. Let's leave this at a value of 0. 
The delay before reset is the amount of time in seconds the button will be available to be pressed again after being pressed. You can also put minus 1 in this option to make the button only be activated once. Let's put a value of 15 into this option so it will only be able to be activated once every 15 seconds. Now before we playtest, make sure all your spellings for your name and target options are correct. If they are not, your lift will not appear in game. I actually made this mistake when making this episode and had to reduce some of the footage, so just be sure your names are correct and don't be like me. With all that said, let's playtest our lift. Congratulations, you have successfully learned how to create stairs, ladders, and lifts. Thank you so much for watching the video and I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below and I'll try my best to help. I will see you next time in the 8th episode of the Level Creation Guide for Half-Life.